Welcome to this lesson on visualizing and summarizing qualitative data. The three main objectives for this lesson are to talk about the types of qualitative data, of which there are two, nominal and ordinal, and we'll discuss the differences between them shortly. To summarize qualitative data, in which case we'll learn about the frequency distribution table, and to explore the common graphs that are used for qualitative data, in particular Pareto charts, pie charts, and bar graphs. The first type of data that we're going to talk about is nominal data. Nominal data is data that essentially consists of nothing more than names. So I want to present an example here where we're looking at um, the eye color of individuals that came into an ophthalmologist's office. First, we'll start by listing out all of the values that were observed for this particular variable. In particular, there were four observations. There were individuals with blue eyes, individuals with brown eyes, individuals with hazel eyes, and individuals with green eyes. Now for this particular data set, it just so happens that there were 12 individuals that had blue eyes, 22 individuals that had brown eyes, two individuals that had hazel eyes, and four individuals that had green eyes. Now we want to emphasize here, the data are the values that were observed for the individuals, and the frequencies are the counts of those values, how often those values actually showed up in the data set. Again, we want to emphasize the data here is the eye colors. In particular, the data are the values of the variable that was being observed. In particular, we want to emphasize that the data is not the frequencies. The frequencies are simply the occurrences of how frequently each value is observed in the data set. Now, one feature that we can see from this is that if we actually sum the frequencies, we can actually determine what the sample size was for this particular data set. But the notation introduced here, the highlighted letter is the Greek letter sigma, capital sigma, and that stands for the sum and the lowercase f stands for the sum of uh, all the frequencies that were observed in this frequency distribution table. One of the things we can do with a frequency distribution table is convert it to what is called a relative frequency distribution table. Again, the sample size could change from sample, from sample to sample. In this case, if we add the frequencies, we see that there were a total of 40 participants or 40 individuals that came into the ophthalmologists. If we wanted to try to determine if this might be useful information that allows us to compare to other groups of people that may have come in, we want to make those comparisons on the same scale, i.e. we want to do a relative comparison. So in that case, we instead of reporting the actual absolute frequencies for each of the values observed in the data set, we instead report the relative frequency. To calculate the relative frequency, you take the frequency and divide by the total sample size. In this case, we would take the value in this case, you would take the value 12, for the number of individuals that had blue eyes, divide that by 40, and get the value 30%. That same process would then be repeated for all the frequencies in the FDT. And if we notice, if we add the frequencies, they add up to the sample size. If we add the relative frequencies, they would add to 100%. Now, sometimes if you have a table that's been reported as a relative frequency distribution table, or a relative FDT, the percentages may not add perfectly to 100%, but within rounding, they should be very close. The FTT allows us to summarize nominal data. If we next want to visualize nominal data, we have a couple standard tools. Technically, we're visualizing the distribution of the nominal data. And the two tools that are often used are the bar graph and the pie chart. And in particular, there's a special name for a bar graph that's used for nominal data. That's called the Pareto chart. To understand the Pareto chart, we first start with the frequency distribution table. So the key to a Pareto chart is that it takes advantage of the fact that nominal data has a subjective order. In other words, because the values are just names, there's no completely um, objective way to put the values in order. And because of the ability to reorder that essentially allows us to say that um, we could order the data in any particular fashion we prefer. And what we're going to do here is we're actually going to reorder the data by frequency. And since brown is the most frequently occurring value, we'll put that first. And since hazel is the least frequently occurring category, we'll put that last. And as a result, we see that we now have our data sorted by frequency of occurrence. Brown is the most frequently occurring value in the data set, often called the mode. Blue comes in next with 12 people having blue eyes. Uh, there were four individuals with green eyes, and the least occurring color was hazel. Now, the basic rule for Pareto charts is that bars are presented in a descending order. So in this case, we reorder our, our, our frequency distribution table from most frequently occurring to least frequently occurring, and consequently, we can actually present a graph of that information.
Here we see the graph being drawn where the heights represent the frequencies for how many values actually, how many individuals actually were observed with that particular eye color. And the key to note is that the height of the bars are presented in a manner where the heights are simply decreasing. Now for our example, we saw that the bars were presented in descending order, but actually for a Pareto chart, it's actually possible to also put it in increasing order. Um, that's actually considered acceptable as well. It really depends on what you hope to draw attention to. If you intend to draw attention to things that occur the most, you might want to put that farthest to the left, whereas if you want to draw attention to things that are occurring the least, you might want to put that uh, farthest to the left. Now, when we present these rules, we want to recognize that the rules are presented as guidelines, and sometimes it's actually okay to break the rules. So it's possible to, to quote unquote, break the pattern of monotonicity, that's where everything's increasing or decreasing, uh, particularly if you have the other category, that's sort of where you have a lot of, uh, sometimes in nominal data, you'll have so much data, uh, so many different values for the variable that you're looking to measure that you actually have to focus on the most frequently occurring ones and then you sort of clump the rest into the other category. So the new rule that we should consider here is that um, if you do have an, an other category and that little bar at the end might be larger than some of the ones that came before it, any frequency that shows up in the sum for that other category should be less than the frequency of the smallest non-other bar. In other words, if that some information had been taken out of the other category, you wouldn't want it to have a bar that would actually be further to the left of where the other bar is actually occurring. Now, the other common graph that's used to visualize qualitative data is the pie chart. And what happens here is you take the relative frequency and multiply the relative frequency by 360 degrees to get the sector angle or the size of each individual pie that should be in the pie chart. So what you do to calculate the sector angle for any one piece of the pie, you take the relative frequency and multiply it by the total number of degrees, uh, 360 degrees in the circle, and that would then give you the angle that gives the size for that piece of the pie. So for example, the individuals with blue eyes would be represented by a piece of the pie that has an angle of 108 degrees. Here we see the graphical representation of the pie chart for this data set. And then point to note is that the angle here of this blue sector, the, this piece of pie, this angle here is 180 degrees, whereas this angle here is 198 degrees because that represents the, the brown portion. Here are the rules that I would present for pie charts. So it's best to think of this as to when you wouldn't use a pie chart. So simply put, you wouldn't use a pie chart if there are too many categories. So if you have about six categories, that probably suggests a pie chart's okay. Getting up to about 12 categories, 10 to 12, you're in the maybe range. Um, and if you have 15 to 18 categories or more, you probably are just looking at having too many pieces of the pie to have a pie chart be useful in any particular manner. The other reason why you might not want to use a pie chart is if you have too many very, very thin slivers. For example, um, if the relative frequencies are small, it, the, the piece of the pie would be relatively small. So if all of your pieces are 5% or greater, there's probably not an issue. Uh, it's probably perfectly okay to use a pie chart. If you have a few at, at about the 2 to 3% range, uh, a pie chart is probably okay. But if you have any that are in the half to 1% range, that piece of the pie is going to be so slim. And if you have lots of those, it essentially becomes impossible to tell them apart. Uh, additionally, if you have any missing or unclassified data, in other words, if you're not actually presenting an image of the entire whole of what you're uh, presenting as information that's been broken down into different categories, then you wouldn't want to use a pie chart. And in particular, uh, you always want to use a pie chart if it's appropriate to the comparison or the information that you're trying to present. So if you're talking about comparing um, non-extreme uh, pieces of information, uh, in other words, if you're trying to show information that's better presented in a bar graph or a Pareto chart, for example, showing that a couple categories are relatively close or, or there's not much of a distribution, not much of a change in the, the frequency of, the, of those categories, that's something that might be better presented in a bar graph. Whereas if your emphasis is on showing that there are very clear distinctions between categories that show up a lot and categories that show up very infrequently, then the pie chart might be the appropriate one to use. So again, if you're not focusing on extreme, non-extreme detailed comparisons, if the non-extreme detailed comparisons are not required, uh, then the pie chart might be the appropriate way to go. Now we want to move on to talking about uh, the other type of qualitative data, which is ordinal data. Uh, nominal data is data essentially which is nothing but a name. And the key point there is that the ordering is arbitrary. And we already took advantage of that. That's why we could reorder the bars by frequency for the Pareto chart. Ordinal data, however, 
is categorical data that does have an objective ordering. In other words, it wouldn't make sense to actually just kind of go around and willy-nilly change the order of the data. A couple examples of ordinal data, categories that are, can be ranked, are the uh, Olympic medals, where you are they're ordered from gold, silver, bronze for first, second, and third place. The idea is that, for example, if someone were running a race, uh, the person who got the gold medal ran a faster time than someone who ran the silver, and in turn they ran a faster time than someone who ran the bronze. So despite the fact we might not know how far apart those time differences actually are, we know that there was an actual ordering. Or sometimes broad categories, like when you're describing the size of a car at a, rent a car rental, you could choose between compact, regular size, or SUV, and there's an inherent order in the size of the vehicles for those particular values. Now, as we saw with nominal data, for ordinal data, um, we can still create a frequency distribution table, an FDT, where simply we look at the different observations that were observed and we count how frequently they occurred. So here what we have is uh, people that were responding to a survey and they were asked to rate a particular um, experience and some said that they uh, indicated that they thought the experience was good and two of those individuals polled strongly disagreed with that statement so in other words they didn't think that the experience was good two disagreed uh, six were neutral and 20 agreed and, uh, and 18 strongly agreed with that statement now the key is we can't turn this into a Pareto chart because we can't actually change the order of these responses that's something you can do with nominal data but you can't actually do it here because even though agree occurs 20 times where strongly agree only occurs 18 times, we actually can't change that ordering and put agree top and then have strongly agree come after that because it just doesn't follow the natural ordering of the data. Now again, for ordinal data, we can't make a Pareto chart, okay, because we can't reorder it. But that doesn't mean we can't make a bar graph. The bar graph can be drawn, but it has to be drawn in a manner that respects the order of the data. So in other words, the data along the horizontal axis has to be presented in the order from strongly disagree to strongly agree, or, or it could be switched going from strongly agree to strongly disagree, depending on which of the values you want to emphasize at the beginning of the graph. Now, this actually means though that there's, so just as before we could calculate the frequency distribution or the relative frequency distribution, now we actually have another tool at our disposal, which is the idea of a cumulative frequency distribution. The ordering of the values allows us to aggregate the data in a way that lets us talk about reaching a certain level or below or reaching a certain level or above. So let's talk through uh, the cumulative frequency distribution table. In particular, how each of the values are actually calculated. So we notice for the first category, so the first part we have, over here we have the table that presents the FDT. Here we have the cumulative FDT. The first thing to notice is that the labels for the response have to change slightly because we're no longer talking about strongly disagree as a single category and disagree as a string single category, but instead we're talking about all the people that responded at least strongly disagree, strongly disagree or at least neutral or at least strongly agree. So how are these values calculated? Well, to get the cumulative frequency, if we want to know all the people that responded at least disagree, we need to add together the 2 for the strongly disagree and the 4 for the disagree to give us 6. That means there were 6 people that responded at least disagree. And then if we want to ask how many people responded at least agree, there were a total of 2 plus 4 plus 6 plus 20. All the people that responded agree or lower responded at least agree on this scale. Now, just a couple of other points to note. Um, interestingly enough, if you look at the, in the cumulative frequency distribution table, if you look at the category at least strongly disagree, well, that's just the same thing as strongly disagree, and there are only two people because that was at the far lowest end of the scale. Uh, in the same way, if you asked, uh, when you ask how many people responded at least strongly agree, there were a total of 50 people that responded that way, and that's actually the entire sample because um, responding at least strongly agree covers everyone who responded agree, neutral, disagree, or strongly disagree. And so consequently, the last value in the cumulative frequency distribution table or the last frequency reported would always be the sample size. The other thing you can note uh, that, that's not presented here is, but it's possible to present this in the uh, reverse form. So you could actually have the people that responded at most strongly agree, at most agree, at most neutral, in which case the, the cumulative frequency would be constructed in the other order, where we would start at 18, then add 18, 20, 18, 20, and 6, etc. All right, to close, I'm going to present the end of class question. If your instructor has asked you to uh, 
respond to these, uh, please go ahead and uh, respond as your instructor has requested. So here we have uh, the information for the final course grades for a math class. And in particular, the information has been presented as a cumulative frequency distribution table. Emphasis on the fact that it's a cumulative frequency distribution table. The end of class question here is to, to determine how many people earned a B in the class. Not a grade of at least B, but a grade of B. All right. Thank you so much for listening. Take care.